Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me this afternoon so that we can discuss the decision by the Baker County Circuit Court Judge Matt Shercliffe in regard to our litigation against the governor's emergency orders. What we had today was a preliminary injunction order issued by the Circuit Court Judge which applies to the governor and to her executive branch and this preliminary injunction basically orders the governor to stand down in terms of enforcement of her executive orders as it relates to closures of businesses and religious organizations, houses of worship, and the like. The impact of this preliminary injunction means that the governor's orders are no longer orders that are enforceable as a criminal violation. And as you likely know, her orders previously could be considered criminal misdemeanors if that is violation could be considered a criminal misdemeanor, a class C misdemeanor imposable by a, a, a sanction of up to 30 days in jail and up to a fine of $1,250. Now, this preliminary injunction will promptly be taken up to the Oregon Supreme Court by the state. They've already indicated they'll do that and we may see action by the Supreme Court in hours or days. We hope to be able to participate in a discussion with the Oregon Supreme Court as to whether they would issue a stay, which would be a suspension of this preliminary injunction. We'll find out very soon whether or not there will be such a discussion. Certainly the Oregon Supreme Court on petition from the Oregon Department of Justice on behalf of the governor will discuss, hold a hearing on, and consider whether it would issue what is called mandamus, which would be an order in it might be in order to stay the circuit court judge's decision, or it might be in order to reverse it. We certainly will be arguing those issues uh, before the Oregon Supreme Court, but for the moment, that preliminary injunction has gone into effect today. The state asked for a 48-hour delay in the entry of the order, and the judge denied that. It's so, now joining the conference. As we go forward, we've got a situation where a judge has looked at the entire situation and has looked at Oregon's statutory scheme. And please understand that with our 50 states, every state has a different constitutional system and statutory system in regard to emergencies. There's some old laws in a lot of states and old emergency proclamation uh, discussions in their constitutions. And essentially every state gets to decide what are the powers of the governor in an emergency and how long are those powers in effect. We in Oregon have three levels of public health emergency powers. One is precise, it's in the Oregon Constitution. It was adopted by the Oregon voters as Article 10A. And Article 10A said the governor may declare a catastrophic disaster consisting of a number of things. It could be a volcanic eruption, an earthquake, or a public health emergency. There are a number of types of emergencies that can be catastrophic disasters. She has not followed that constitutional provision. But since it says may, that's simply a tool that was made available to the governor and she's not used it. We recognize that. It's interesting though that that tool had a 30 day time limit on it and if she had declared a public health emergency constituting a catastrophic disaster, then there would have been a 30 day expiration on that proclamation and she would have to convene the legislature to decide what else to do. She didn't use that tool. There's two other tools. One is a 1949 vintage law about public disasters. And it was designed, if you read it, to deal with floods, storms, those kinds of conditions, forest fires. And it allowed the governor to step in and use all of the available resources of the state and local government to intervene. But more recently, the Oregon legislature, from 2003 to 2007, adopted specific legislation for a public health emergency. It's defined in law, and the governor declared a public health emergency on March 8. And that specific legislation says that the governor may declare and follow through with the powers that she has in a public health emergency for 14 days. She can extend it for another 14 days, and then the power is over, 28 days. This is a statutory system that is precise. It deals with public health emergencies. It doesn't deal with floods and storms Claire, and problem? fires. Is now and joining so the, conference. the language of that statute is precise, and the judge recognized and agreed with our argument that that 28-day time limit applies, 
and the governor's extraordinary powers that she's using in her executive orders are complete and really now null and void as to a public health emergency as she declared it. Now, that doesn't mean that the governor doesn't have some power available in terms of her agencies, their regulatory process. There could be some safety in the workplace issues that could be addressed by Orosha, but they can't go outside the statutes, which they could do for the first 28 days. There can be some other provisions that are carried out and enforced by the executive branch relating to, for instance, the Oregon Health Authority, but they can't go outside the statutes. Under the statutory scheme for a public health emergency, the governor could go way beyond that. She could close businesses. She could close houses of worship. It's supposed to have been targeted better than it has been, but it could have happened. It happened for 28 days, but it can't happen anymore. That power has expired. That's what the judge ruled today, and we think it was a good ruling. We'll be prepared to defend that in front of the Oregon Supreme Court. And with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions. I do want to mention one other thing. Ray Hackey with the Pacific Justice Institute had been in touch with us. My group is Common Sense for Oregon, and he very much wanted to deal with a religious freedom issue and seek court intervention to protect the right of people to come together to worship the Almighty. We agreed with him on that, but we also said, well, we should expand the scope of this. Let's look at other entities that are affected, such as colleges and universities and businesses, especially businesses right now in terms of the economic impact. And uh, so he agreed, they expanded their approach, and then we intervened to support all of that. So our Common Sense for Oregon organization supported the challenge to the restrictions on religious freedom, but also challenged the restrictions on the capability of businesses to operate, et cetera. A final thing I want to mention is that we're not asking people to be irresponsible. I brought my mask today, custom made by my wife, has a nice kitten on it. I've worn this to Target and Fred Meyer and Safeway when I'm interacting with people. We are not saying that people shouldn't use common sense discretion and be listening to guidelines and to be careful, especially in those communities which have been heavily hit by this coronavirus pandemic. But there are other communities in the state, counties where there's been zero or one coronavirus case. And they should be able to take that into consideration when they're deciding whether or not to go to their local church and participate in a religious ceremony, or whether or not the local business that's a beauty parlor or a barbershop has to be shut down when nobody in that community has been affected. This is a matter now that relates to common sense discretion on the part of Oregonians, and in each county, the county commissioners may address some particular issues at the county level. But we are no longer in a situation, which we've had until today, where the counties had to go to the governor and say, oh, please, please give us permission to unlock our county or unlock certain businesses. No, the tables have been turned. The local people are empowered to worship God, to conduct their businesses as they think is best. And then if there's something going on in a county that needs to be addressed, county commissioners can address that without asking permission from the governor, but simply doing what they think is right in light of the epidemic that they're confronting. So we're glad to have seen this decision by the judge, and, uh, and I'm pleased that our Common Sense for Oregon organization was able to represent these interveners and bring about justice for Oregonians. So, Kevin, it was initially a church that, that brought forward concerns, and it was actually you and your organization that expanded the, the scope of this case, I guess, to include businesses and other... other that is correct. The uh, Pacific Justice Institute came in on behalf of several churches, Elkhorn Baptist Church being the, the first client, uh, and, uh, and they expanded that list tremendously with a lot of other worshipers and churches. And we joined in saying we support that, but we also think that there ought to be a, a broader issue here as to the regulatory system of the statute and the time, the time limit, which applies not just to any limits on churches, but as to limits on businesses. That's correct. The executive orders that ordered closure or that prohibited certain conduct no longer have effect. The ones that had to do with closures. There may be some other executive orders that deal with how you implement protective gear and that sort of thing that are based on regular statutes and uh, 
the governor still has regular statutory authority, but does not have this extraordinary power to close down churches and businesses. Well, actually, our circuit court system empowers every circuit court judge to be able to deal with state law. This was not a county issue. It was not an ordinance in the county. It's state law, and the judge, when he enters an order in this matter, is a state court judge. These are circuit court judges, and the state court judge can apply the decision statewide. I can clear this up. Yeah. The governor is saying the 1949 vintage law that was last really updated in 1983, it had one minor change about unemployment compensation in 2008, that that is all powerful and it has no time limit and it applies everywhere. Nowhere, nowhere in that 1949 law is there any reference to a public health emergency. When you read it, it's about storms, floods, forest fires. Fast forward to 2003 to 2007, the legislature enacted another law, which is specifically about public health emergencies, and that one has the 28-day time limit in it. With that 28-day time limit as to the additional powers that the governor was given, the 1949 law does not give the governor the power to close businesses or churches or colleges or universities. The new law on public health emergency does have a clause that does say that the governor has extraordinary powers to do that to deal with an epidemic. Well, that's what she was doing is what the judge saw. And we say that from the very first executive order that was issued by the governor on March 8, she referred to this as a public health emergency. She referred to it three times in that first executive order. She's continued to refer to it as such. And she has had reference to the public health emergency statutes. She also has referred to the general emergency law, which is OK, because under the public health emergency statute, which has more power for the governor, it says, oh, by the way, you can also use the power you have under the general emergency statute. But it doesn't give you more than 28 days to do that. So the public health emergency statute is primary. It says the governor can do everything there, including all the closures. And that's the only statute that talks about closures unless you go to the Constitution. And the governor never said that this is a catastrophic disaster. I think she should have, and she could have, but she didn't. And instead, this public health emergency has been treated statutorily by her. We can't force her to use that tool, which is very powerful. And I don't know why she didn't use the tool, except maybe she didn't want to call the legislature into session within 30 days so that they could address the matter. That's just me guessing. And that 1949 law, are you referring to uh, the revised statute 443.441? Is that correct? 433.441 is the public health emergency statutory system. The general emergency law, I can get that citation for you. I, know, I remember the last three members are 165. The general emergency law is under ORS 401.165. And the judge's order makes it clear that he recognizes that this was treated as a public health emergency that statute applied and the time limit, the expiration date applied, and uh, the powers of the governor to do extraordinary things have ended. Um, let's talk about some of the, because I know some of the concerns maybe surrounding this. And you mentioned those counties that have very low cases, maybe zero cases. You know, let's give those people the opportunity to, to conduct business and go about their lives. But what about if people start doing that in the counties where there are lots of cases and there are still deaths? Power to, to the people of Oregon, right? Saying, be smart, be safe. But how do we guarantee that that should happen? Well, 
Well, we're giving the power to the people of Oregon, but we're also giving the power to county commissioners. County commissioners under their charters do have extraordinary powers for emergencies. They often bring the governor in to bring in the help from the state. But in a given county, the commissioners can say, we have a problem here and we're going to address this problem as a county. But that doesn't mean that the governor gets to take over the county. I'll mention something about other. Sure. The state just filed a petition for writ of mandate just moments ago. What might people expect to find on that? Well, if they filed a petition for a writ of mandamus from the Supreme Court, that's asking the Supreme Court to intervene and to order that this order be set aside. I don't know yet if they also moved for a stay or if they're simply asking for the writ of mandamus. I expect to be. One of my associate attorneys back at the office has been posted to duty here. We'll probably be hearing about the creation of a hearing date soon for the Supreme Court to hear this, probably by video conference. And uh, they too have the, the judicial branch is allowed to address this uh, pandemic in their own way. They have been relaxing some of their rules, but they created special rules to be responsible and they may because they are a separate branch of government. So we'll be prepared to respond promptly. I was about to throw in a comment about the other states because we did look at well, how can Governor Mario Cuomo of New York keep issuing more executive orders and emergency orders? Well, their constitution and statutes actually allow Governor Cuomo constant 30-day extensions, and he's using them. And California, uh, and the California governor has a different statutory and regulatory scheme, and it looks like he can keep extending too, unless the legislature intervenes to cut it off. In Washington, the governor has the capability to extend unless the legislature, by resolution, overcomes it, or a legislative council, which they have in Washington, steps in by majority vote to stop it. Oregon has a 28-day time limit in the statutes. Maybe other states will take a lesson from us in the future about what to do about public health emergencies. We also are the only state in at least the last 20 years to have adopted a special article to our Constitution to deal with disasters. We've thought about it. We've balanced the powers of the governor with the powers of the people and their representatives. We set up this catastrophic disaster scheme to give the governor extraordinary powers, but a time limit. That has a 30-day time limit, and then she must convene the legislature to decide what else to do. And the legislature is allowed to convene with some special provisions that give them flexibility. Imagine if we have an earthquake that destroys the Capitol. They don't have to convene at the Capitol. They can convene somewhere else. It even allows for legislators to participate by electronic means so that if they can't get together because of the disaster, they can still be there on behalf of the people that they represent. So Oregon's been very special. I like to mention this in the context of our history. This state recognized the right of women to vote years before the federal constitution was amended to recognize the right of women to vote. This state provided that we would directly elect our U.S. senators by vote of the people. Years before the federal constitution was changed, originally U.S. senators were selected by state legislatures. And our people came together and said, no, we're going to change that. We're going to empower the people. This state started the initiative and referendum system more than 100 years ago, which has spread to about two-thirds of the states. But it empowers the people. So we've done a lot of special things. And guess what? As to public health emergencies, we did something special in 2012, and we did it with a legislative referral. The legislature, by a 30 to 0 vote in the Senate and a 57 to 3 vote in the House, passed this joint resolution to refer Article 10A to the voters, and then in November 2012, the voters adopted it. So we've done a balancing of powers here to address disasters. And in this case, it's unfortunate that the governor has not been respectful of the statutory balancing of powers as to public health emergencies. And that's what this case really was all about. So what are the next steps, I guess, if, if the writ of mandamus were to be filed? And what, what could that timeline look like? Because in the meantime, people can open, right? Well, right now, as of this afternoon, unless the Supreme Court stays the injunction issued by the circuit court judge, um, businesses are free to proceed as though they've not been ordered to be closed. Churches are free to have their worshipers gather. Now, 
I'm also going to say quickly they should all be socially responsible about to handle how they handled it, looking at their community, and I respect that. But the governor's orders are no longer enforceable on pain of committing a crime. Now, within days, I think, we'll see action by the Supreme Court and reviewing this matter and deciding uh, whether or not to uphold the judge's injunction or to set it aside. Do cases like the one in Wisconsin, you know, give you confidence that, that this is going in the direction you want it to go? I think, well, the Wisconsin case is a positive reflection of the Supreme Court of Wisconsin being sensitive to what their statutory procedures were all about and the governor having violated theirs. Our system is different but it gives me confidence that our judges will independently look at what is right under Oregon law and apply that and not feel that they have to kowtow to the executive branch when the executive branch, through the governor in this case, is not observing the limitations of Oregon law.